We're back reading Stuart Little, and we're on chapter 8 on page 47. The questions to look for are, how did Stuart catch bronchitis? Two, what did Stuart do to Margolo? And three, what did Stuart do to Snowball's ear? Snowball's ear. All right, ready? Chapter 8, Margolo. Because he was so small, Stuart was often hard to find around the house. His father and his mother and his brother, George, seldom could locate him by looking for him. Usually, they had to call him, and the house often, often echoed with cries of, Stuart, Stuart. You would come into a room, and he might be curled up in a chair, but you wouldn't see him. Mr. Little was in, a, in con constant fear of losing him and never finding him again. He even made him a tiny red cape, such as hunters wear, so that he would be easier to, to see. One day, when he was seven years old, Stuart was in the kitchen watching his mother make topi topica put... Topica... Top <laughs> Whoopsies. Topica pudding. He was feeling hungry, and when Mrs. Little opened the door of the electric refrigerator to get something, Stork slipped inside to see if he could find a piece of cheese. He supposed, of course, his mother had seen him, and when the door swung shut and he realized he was locked in, it surprised him greatly. Help, he called. In the It's dark in here. It's cold in this refrigerator. Help, let me out. I'm getting colder by the minute. But his voice was not strong enough to penetrate the thick wall. In the darkness, he stumbled and fell into a saucer of prunes. The juice was cold. Stort shivered and his teeth chattered together. It wasn't until half an hour later that Mrs. Little opened up again opened the door and found him standing on a butter plate beating his arms together to keep him warm and blowing on his hands and hopping up and down mercy she cried stuart my poor little boy how about a nip of brandy said stuart i'm chilled to the bone but his mother made him some hot broth instead and put him to bed in his cigarette box with a doll's hot water bottle against his feet even so, Stuart caught a bad cold, and this turned into bronchitis, and Stuart had to stay in bed for almost two weeks. During this, his illness, the other members of the family were extremely kind to Stuart. Mrs. Little played tic-tac-tic-tac-toe <laughs> with him. George made him a soap bubble pipe and a bow and arrow. Mr. Little made him a pair of ice skates around, out of two paper clips. One cold afternoon, Mrs. Little was shaking her dust cloth out of the window when she noticed a small bird lying on the windowsill, apparently dead. She brought it in and put it near the radiator, and in a short while, it fluttered its wings and opened its eyes. It was a pretty little hen bird, brown with a streak of yellow on her breast. The Littles didn't agree on what kind of bird she was. She's a wallowed-eyed vero, said George scientifically. I think she's more like a young wren, said Mr. Little. Anyway, they fixed a place for her to, for her in the living room and fed her and gave her a cup of water. Soon she felt much better and went hopping around the house examining everything with, a great, with the greatest care and interest. Presently she hopped upstairs and into Stuart's room where she w where he was laying in bed. Hello, said Stuart. Who are you? Where'd you come from? My name is Margolo, said the bird softly in a musical voice. I come from the fields, once tall with wheat, from pastures deep in the fir deep in fern and th thistle. I came from vows of meadow sweet, and I love to whistle. Stuart sat bolt upright in bed sat bolt upright in bed. Say that again, he said. I can't, reply Margolo. I have a sore throat. So have I, I said Stuart. 
I've got bronchitis. You better not get it, get too near me. Better not get too near me. You might catch it. I'll stay right here by the door, said Margalow. You can use some of my gargle if you want to, said Stuart. And here are some nose drops, and I have plenty of Kleenex. Thank you very much. You are very kind, replied the bird. Did they take your temperatures, asked Stuart, who was beginning to be genuine, genuinely worried about his new friend's health? No, said Marglow, but I don't think it will be necessary. Well, we better make sure, said Stuart, because I would hate to have anything happen to you. Here. And he tossed her the thermometer. Margolo put it under her tongue, and she and Stuart sat very still for three minutes. Then she took it out of, out and looked at it, turning it slowly and carefully. Normal, she announced. Stuart felt his heart leap, leap for gladness. It seems to him that he had never seen a cre any creature so beautiful as this tiny bird, and he already loved her. I hope. He remarked that my parents have fixed you up with a decent place to sleep. Oh, yes, Margolo replied. I'm going to sleep in the Boston Fern on the bookshelf, bookshelf in the living room. It's a nice place for a city location. And now, now, if you'll excuse me, I think I shall go to bed. I see it's getting dark outside. I always go to bed at sundown. Good night, sir. Please don't call me sir, cried Stuart. Call me Stuart. Very well, said the bird. Good night, Stuart. And she hopped off with light bouncing steps. Good night, Margolo, cried Stuart. See you in the morning. Stuart settled back under the bedclothes again. There's a mighty fine bird. There's a mighty fine bird, he whispered, and sighed a tender sigh. When Mrs. Little came in later to tuck Stuart in for the night and hear his prayers, Stuart asked her, if she thought the bird would be quite safe sleeping down in the living room. Quite safe, my dear, replied Mrs. Little. What about that cat, Snowbell? Asked Stuart sternly. Snowbell won't touch the bird, his mother said. You go to sleep and forget all about it, Mrs. Little. Open the window and turned out the light. Stuart closed his eyes and lay there in the dark, but he couldn't seem to go to sleep. He tossed and turned, and the bedclothes got all rumpled up. He kept thinking about the bird downstairs, asleep in the ferns. ferns. He kept thinking about Snowbell and the way that Snowbell's eyes gleamed. Finally, unable to stand it any longer, he switched on the light. There, there's just something in me that doesn't trust a cat, he muttered. I can't sleep, knowing that Margolo is in danger. Pushing the covers back, Stuart climbed out of bed. He put on his wrapper and slippers. Taking his bow and arrow and his flashlight, he tiptoed out onto the out into the hall. Everybody had gone to bed, and his house was dark. Stuart found his way to the stairs and descended slowly and cautiously into the living room, making no noise. His throat hurt him, and he felt a little bit dizzy. Sick as I am, he said to himself, this has got to be done. Being careful not to make a sound, he stole across to the lamp by the bookshelf, sh sh shined up the cord, and climbed out onto the shelf. There was a faint ray of light from the street lamp outside, and Stuart could dimly see Margot asleep in the fern, her head tucked under the wing. Sleep sleep dwell upon thin eyes, peace in thy breast, he whispered, repeated a speech he had heard in the movies. Then he hid behind a candlestick and waited, listen, waited, listening and watching. For half an hour he saw nothing, heard nothing, but the faint raffle of Margot's wings when he s s stirred in a dr in, the, in dream. The clock struck ten loudly, and before the sound of the last stroke had died away, Stuart saw two gleaming eyes peering in, peering out from behind the sofa. So, thought Stuart, I guess there's going to be something going on doing after all. He reached for the bow and arrow. The eyes came near. 
Stuart was frightened, but he was a brave mouse, even when it came to a sore throat. He placed the arrow against the cord of the bow and waited. Snowbell crept softly toward the bookshelf and climbed noiselessly up into the chair with an easy reach of the Boston fern while Margola was asleep. Then he crouched, ready to spring his tail, waved back and forth, his eyes gleamed bright. Stuart d decided that time had come. He stepped out from behind the candlestick, knelt down, bent his bow, and took careful aim at Snowbell's left ear, which was the nearest to him. When, the, when is the finest thing I've ever done, thought Stuart. This is the finest thing I've ever done, thought Stuart. And he shot the arrow straight into the cat's ears. Snowbell squeaked, squealed with pain and jumped down and ran off toward the kitchen. A direct hit, said Stuart. Thank heaven. Well, there is a good night's work done. And he threw a kiss towards Margolo, sleeping from... He was a tired little mouse that crawled into bed a few minutes later, tired but ready for sleep at last. Alright, that's the end of chapter 8. We're on chapter 9 now, on page 57. And the questions you need to answer will be, number 1, why did Stuart jump into the garbage can? Two, where was the garbage truck going? And three, where was Stuart, why was Stuart sad that he might die? Come here. Got a little crybaby with me. <laughs> All right, so a narrow escape. Margola liked it so well at the Littles' house, she decided to stay for a while instead of returning to the open country. She and Stuart became fast friends, and as the days passed, it seemed to Stuart that she grew more and more beautiful. He hoped she would never go away from him. One day, when Stuart had recovered from bronchitis, he took his new skates and put on his ski pants and went out to look for an ice pond. He didn't get far. That minute, he stepped onto the street he saw an Irish terrier, so he had to shinny, shinny up an iron gate and jump into a garbage can where he had in a grove of celery. While he was there waiting for the dog to go away, a garbage truck from the Department of San Sanitation drove up to the curb and the two men picked up the can. Stuart felt himself being hoisted high in the air he peered over the side and saw that another that in another in, instant he and everything in the can would be dumped into the big truck if i jump now i'll kill myself that stuart so he ducked back into the can and waited the men threw the can with a loud bump into the truck where another man grabbed it and t turned it upside down and shook everything out stuart landed on his head Buried, buried two feet deep in wet, slant, slippery garbage. All around him was garbage, smelling strong. Under him, over him, and all four sides of him, garbage. Just an enormous world of garbage and trash and smell. It was a messy spot to be in. He had egg on his trouser, trousers, butter on his cap, gravy on his shirt, orange pulp in his ear, and banana peel wrapped around his waist. Still hanging on to his skates, Stuart tried to make him his way up to the surface of the garbage, but the footing was bad. He climbed up he climbed a pile of coffee grounds, but near the top of the grounds gave way under him, and he slid down and landed in a pool of leftover rice pudding. I bet I'm going to be Sick to my stump, sick at my stomach before I get out of this, said Stuart. He was anxious to work his way up to the top of the pile because he was afraid of being squashed by the squashed by the next can load of garbage. 
when at last he did succeed in getting to the surface, try, tired and smelly, he observed that the truck was not making any more collections, but was rumbling rapidly along. Stuart glanced up at the sun. We're going east, he said to himself. I wonder what that means. There was no way for him to get out of this truck. The sides were too high. He just had to wait. He, When the truck arrived at the East River, which borders New York City, on the east and which is rather dirty but useful river, the driver drove out onto the pier, backed up to the garbage scow, and dumped his load. Stuart went crashing and slithering along with everything else and hits his head so hard so hard he fainted and lay quiet still still as though dead he lay that way for almost an hour and was when he recovered his senses he almost he looked about him and saw nothing but water the scowl and being towed out to sea well fat stort this is about the worst thing that could happen to anybody i guess i guess this was will be my last ride in the world for he knew that the garbage would be towed 20 miles out and dumped into the Atlantic Ocean. I guess there's nothing I can do about it, he thought hopelessly. I'll just have to sit here bravely and die like a man, but I wish I didn't have to die with an egg on my pants and butter on my cap and gravy on my shirt and orange pulp in my ear and a banana peel wrapped around my middle. The thought of death, death made Stuart sad. And he began to think of his home and of his mo father and mother and brother and of Margot and Snowbell and of how he loved them all but Snowbell. And all of, and of what a pleasant place to place his home was, especially in the early mornings with the light just coming in through the curtains and the household stirring and walk, waking. The tears came into his eyes, and when he realized that he would never see them again, he was still sobbing when a small voice behind him whispered, Stuart? He looked around through his tears, and there sitting on a Brussels sprout was Margolo. Margolo cried, Stuart, how'd you get here? Well, said the bird, I was looking out the window this morning when you left home, and I happened to see you get dumped into the garbage truck. So I flew out the window and followed the truck, thinking that you might need help. I've never been so glad to see anybody in my life, said Stuart. But how are you do going to help me? I think that if you'll hang on to my feet, said Margot, I can fly ashore with you. It's worth trying anyway. How much do you weigh? Three ounces and a half, said Stuart. With your clothes on? Asked Margot. Certainly, replied Stuart modestly. Then I believe I can carry you all right. Supo suppose I get dizzy, said Stuart. Don't look down, re replied Margolo. Then you won't get dizzy. Suppose I get sick at, at my stomach. You'll just have to be sick, the bird replied. Anything is better than death. Yes, that's true, Stuart agreed. Hang on, then. We'll, we may... We may as well get started. Stuart tucked his skates into his sh shirt, step stepped gingerly onto a tuft of lettuce, and took a firm grip onto Margolo's ankles. Already, he cried. With a fluttering of wings, Margolo rose into the sky, carrying Stuart along, and cried. They flew over the ocean and headed toward home. Phew, said Margolo, when... When they were high in the air, you smell awful, Stuart. I know I do, he replied gloomily. I hope this isn't making you feel bad. I can hardly breathe, she answered. And my heart is pounding in my breast. Isn't there something you could drop to make yourself lighter? Well, I guess I could drop these ice skates, said Stuart. Goodness me, the little bird cried. I don't know. I didn't no, you had skates hidden in your skirt, shirt. Toss those heavy skates away quickly, or we might both come down in the ocean and perish. Stuart threw his skates away and watched them, watched them fall down. 
down till they disappeared in the gray waves below. That's better, said Margo. Now we're all right. I can, I can already see the towers and chimneys of New York. Fifteen minutes later, in they flew through the open windows of the Littles' living room and landed on the Boston fern. Mrs. Little, who had left the window up when she missed Margolo, was glad to see them back, for she was be beginning to worry when she heard what had happened and how near she had become to losing her son. She took Stuart in, the hand, in her hand enough through his, even though his clothes smelled nasty, and kissed him. Then she sent him up the stairs to take a bath and sent George out to take Stuart's clothes to the cleaner. What was it like out there in the Atlantic Ocean, inquired Mr. Little, who had never been far, very far from home. So Stuart and Margolo told them about the sea, ocean, and the gray waves curling with white crests, and the gulls in the, sea, in the sky, and the channel boy, and the channel boys, and the ships, and the tugs, and the wind, and the wind making a sound in the ear, in your ears. Mr. Little sighed and said some day he hoped to get away from business long enough to see all those fine things. Everyone thanked Margolo for saving Stuart's life, and at supper time, Mrs. Little presented her with a tiny cake with which had seeds sprinkled on top. All right, so that's the end of chapter nine. Chapter 10 is on page 67. And the questions you'll be looking for are, what did Ignoria Cat tell Snowbell? Two, who overheard the plot to kill Margolo? And three, what did Margolo do when she read the note? So chapter 10, springtime. Snowbell the cat enjoyed nighttime more than daytime. Perhaps it was because his eyes liked the dark, but I think it was because there was... There are always so many worthwhile things going on in New York at night. Snowbell had several friends in the neighborhood. Some of them were house cats. Others were store cats. He knew a Ma Maltese cat in the A&P, a white Persian in the apartment next door, a tortoise shell in the de delicatessen, a tiger cat in the basement of the branch library, and a beautiful young egg Angora, who had escaped from a cage in a pet, pet shop on 3rd Avenue and had gone to live a free life of her own in the tool house of a small park near Stuart's house. One fine spring evening, Snowbell had been calling on Ignora in the park. He stared. He started home late, and it was such a lovely night. She said she would walk along with him to keep him company. When they got to Mr. Little's house, the two cats sat down on the foot, foot of the tall vine which ran up the side of the house past George's bed, bedroom. This vine was useful for Snowbell because he could climb it at night and crawl into the house. Through George's, windows, George's open window, Snowbell began telling his friend about Margolo and Stuart. Goodness, said the Agnoria cat. You mean to say you live in the same house with a bird and a mouse and you don't do anything about it? That's a situation, replied Snowbell. But what can I do about it? Please remember that Stuart is a member of the family and the bird is a permanent guest like myself. Well, said Snowbell's friend, all I can say is you've got more self-control than I have. Doubtless, said Snowbell. However, I sometimes think I've got too much self-control for my own good. I've, t I've been terribly nervous and upset lately, and I think it's because I'm always holding myself in. The cat's voice, voices grew louder, and they talked so loudly that they could never heard a slight rustling in the vine a few feet above their heads. It was a gray pigeon who had been asleep there and had 
and who had awakened the sound of the cats and began to listen. This sounds like an interesting conversation, said the pigeon to himself. Maybe I'd better stay around and see if I can learn something. Look here, he said, the ignoria cat. Say the snowbell. I admit that the cat... I admit that the cat has a duty toward her own people and that under the circumstances it would be wrong for you to eat Mar Mar Margalo, but I'm not a member of your family and there's nothing to stop me from eating her, is there? Nothing that I can... <laughs> Nothing that I can think of offhand, said Snowbell. There he... Then here I go, said the Agnoria cat, starting up the vine. The pigeon was wide awake by this time, ready to fly away, but the voices down below continued. Wait a minute, said Snowbell. Don't be in such a hurry. I don't think you better go in there tonight. Why not, said the other cat. Well, for one thing, you're not supposed to enter our house. It's unlawful entry, and... You might get into trouble. I won't get in any trouble, said the Ignoria. Please wait till tomorrow night, said Snowball firmly. Mr. and Mrs. Little will be going out tomorrow night, and you won't be taking such a risk. It's for your own good I'm suggesting this. Oh, all right, agreed the Ignoria. I guess I can wait, but tell me where I'll find the bird after I get in. That's simple, said Snowbell. Climb this vine. Enter George's room through the open window, then go down then go downstairs and you'll find the bird asleep in the Boston fern in the bookcase. Easy enough, said the Ignoria, licking her chops. I'm obligated to you, sir. Well the old thing whispered the pigeon to himself, and he flew away quickly to find a piece of writing paper and a pencil. Snowbell said goodnight to his friend and climbed up the vine and went to bed. Next morning, Margolo found a note on the branch of her fern and she, uh, when she woke. It said, Beware of a strange cat who will come by night. It was signed a well-wisher. She kept the note under her wing all day, wondering what she had better to do, but she didn't dare show it to anyone, not even Stork. She couldn't eat. She was so frightened. What had I better do? She kept saying to herself, finally, just before dark, she hopped up to the open window, and without saying anything to anybody, she flew away. It was springtime, and flew, she flew north just as fast as she could fly because something inside her told her that north was the way for a bird to go when spring comes to the land. All right, now we're on chapter 11. Mm -hmm. 11 starts on page 72. And the questions you'll have to answer are, why did Stuart run away from home? Two, where did he go see for advice? And three, why wouldn't Stuart's car attract attention? So 11 is the automobile. For three days, everybody haunted all over the house for Margalo without finding so, so much as a feather. I guess she had spring fever, said George. A normal bird doesn't stay indoors this kind of weather. Perhaps she has... A husband somewhere and has gone to meet him suggested mr. little she has not sobbed Stuart bitterly this is just a lot of nonsense how do you know asked George because I asked her one time cried Stuart she told me she was a single bird everybody questioned Snowbell closely but the cat ins insisted he knew nothing about Margot's disappearance I don't see why you have to make a make a para out of me just because that disagreeable little chippy flew the coop, said Snowbell irritably. Stuart was heartbroken. He had no appetite, 
no appetite, refused food, and lost weight. Finally, he decided that he would run away from home without telling anybody and go out into the world and look for Margot. While I am about while I am about it, I might as well seek my fortune too, he thought. Maybe daybreak n next morning, he got out his big gas his biggest handkerchief and in it he placed his toothbrush, his money, his soap, his comb and a brush, a clean suit of underwear and his pocket compass. I ought to take along something to remember my mother by, he thought. So he crept into his mother's bedroom where she was still asleep, climbed the lamp cord to his to the to her burrow and pulled a strand of Mrs. Little's hair from a comb. He rolled the hair up neatly and here's a picture. Neatly and laid it in the handkerchief with the other things. Then he rolled everything up in a bundle and tied it into one end of a wooden match. With his gray felt hat cocked jointly on one side of his head and his pack slung across his shoulder, Stort stole softly out of the house. Goodbye, beautiful home, he whispered. I wonder if I will ever see you again. Stort stood uncertainly for a moment in the street in front of the house. The world was a big place in which to go looking for a lost bird, north, south, east, or west. Which way should he go? Stort decided that he needed advice on such an important matter, so he started uptown to find his friend, Dr. Carey, the surgeon dentist, owner of the Schroomer Wasp. The doctor was... Glad to see Stuart. He took him right onto into his inner office where he was busy pulling a man's tooth. The man's name was Edward Kleinsdale and had several wads of gauze in his cheeks to hold his mouth open good and wide. The tooth was a hard one to get at and the doctor let Stuart sit on his instrument tray so that he could talk during the operation. This is my friend Stuart Little. He said, the man with the gauze in his cheek. How, ooh, ooh, Stort replied the man as the best as he could. There's Stort, the little man right there. Very well, thank you, replied Stort. Well, what's on your mind, Stort asked Dr. Carey, seizing hold of the man's tooth with a pair of pincers and giving a strong pull. I ran away from home this morning, explained Stuart. I am going out into the world to seek my fortune and to look for a lost bird. Which direction do you think I should start in, out about, out in? Dr. Carey twisted the tooth a bit and wrapped it back and forth. What color is the bird, he asked. Brown, said Stuart. Better go north, said Dr. Carey. Don't you think so, Mr. Clydesdale? Ook, in internal arc said Mr. Clydesdale. What, cried Stuart? I ate oak in Central Park, <laughs> said Mr. Clydesdale. He said, look in Central Park, ex explained Dr. Carey, tucking another big wad of gauze into Mr. Clydesdale's cheek, and it's a good suggestion. Often time, oftentimes, people with decayed teeth have sound idea. Ideas. Central Park is a favorite place for birds in the spring. Mr. Clydesdale was nodding his head vigorously and seemed about to speak again. If, oh, oh, okay, uh, erd in entral arc, a, 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 o, orc, <laughs> even, an artford, alway, an ook, in ookanica. What, cried Stuart? Delighted at this new end, new kind of talk, what do you say, Mr. Clydesdale? If u on okay o erd in entral park take a u or e even an artford airway and u uh, Connecticut. Oh, he says if you can't locate the bird in Central Park, take a 
New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railway train in Lincoln, Connecticut, said Dr. Carey. Then he removed the rolls, in a, rolls of a gauze from Mr. Clydesdale's mouth. Rinse, please, he said. Mr. Clydesdale took a glass of mouthwash that was besides the chair and rinsed his mouth out. Tell me this, Stuart, said Dr. Carey. How are you traveling? On foot? Yes, sir, said Stuart. Well, I think you'd better have a car. As soon as I get his tooth out, we'll have we'll see what can be done about it. Open, please, Mr. Clydesdale. Dr. Carey, Carey grabbed the tooth with the princers again, and this time he pulled so long that and so hard, and with such determination, the tooth popped out, which was a great relief to everybody, particularly to Mr. Clydesdale. The doctor then led Stuart into another room. From a shelf, he took a tiny automobile about six inches long. The most perfect miniature automobile Stuart had ever seen. This was bright yellow with black fenders and streamlined car of great graceful design. I made this myself, Dr. Carey said. I enjoy building model cars and boats and other things when I'm not extra extracting teeth. This car was a real gasoline motor in it. Has a real gasoline motor in it. It has a quite a good deal of power. Do you think you can handle it, Stuart? Certainly, replied Stuart, looking into the driver's seat and blowing the horn. But isn't it going to attract too much attention? Won't everybody stop and stare at such a small automobile? They would if they could see you, replied Dr. Carey, but nobody will be able to see you on the in or the car. Why not, said Stuart, because the automobile is thoroughly modern, is a thoroughly modern car. It's not only noiseless, it's invisible. Nobody can see it. I can see it, remarked Stuart. Push that little button, said the doctor, pointless to the pointing to the button on the instrument panel. Stuart pushed the bu button. Instantly, the car vanished from sight. Now push it again, said the doctor. How can I push it when I can't see it? Asked Stuart. Feel around for it. So Stuart, Stuart felt around until the hand came in contact with a button. It seemed like the same button and Stuart pushed it. He heard a slight grinding noise and felt something slip out from un under his hand. Hey, watch out, yelled Dr. Carey. You pushed the starter button. She's off. There she goes. She's away. She loose in the room. Now we'll never catch her. She, he grabbed Stuart up and placed him on the table where he wouldn't get hit by a runaway car. Oh, mercy. Oh, mercy. Stuart cried when he realized what he had done. It was a very awkward situation. Neither Dr. Carey nor Stuart could see that little automobile, yet he was rushing all over under its own power bumping into things. First, there came a crashing noise over by the fireplace. The hearth broom fell down. Dr. Carey leapt for the spot and pounced on the place where the sound came from. But though he was quick, he had hardly gotten his hands on the place when there was another crash over the wastebasket. The doctor pounced again. Pounce, crash, pounce, crash. The doctor was racing all over the room, pouncing and missing. It was almost impossible to catch a speedy, invisible model, model automobile, even when one is skillful. Even when one is a skillful dentist. Oh, oh, yelled Stuart, jumping up and down. I'm sorry, Dr. Carey. I'm dreadful sorry. Get a butterfly net, I shout, shouted the doctor. I can't, said Stuart. I'm not big enough to carry a butterfly net. That's true, said Dr. Carey. I forgot. My apologies, Stuart. The car is bound to stop sometimes, said Stuart, because it will run out of gas. That's true, too, said the doctor. And so he and Stuart sat down and waited patiently until they had no longer heard any crashing sounds in the room. Then the doctor got down on his hands and knees and crawled cautiously all over, feeling here and there until 
At last he found the car. It was in the fireplace, buried up into the hubs in the wood ashes. The doctor pressed the proper button, and there it stood plain sight against the front fenders, crumbled into the radi its radiator leaking, its headlights broken, its windshield shattered, its right rear tire punctured and quite a bit of yellow paint scratched off the hood. What a mess, groaned the doctor. Stuart, I hope this will be a lesson to you. Never push a button on an automobile unless you are sure what you are doing. Yes, sir, answered Stuart. This was this, Stuart, and his eyes filled with tears, each tear being, being smaller than a drop of dew. It had been an unhappy morning, and Stuart, was already homesick. He was sure that he was never going to see Margolo again. Alright, that's the end of the chapter. And I'm going to stop there. So the next video will be on chapter 12. So answer your questions as the best you can and then come back for more chapters.